Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes was published in his first poetry collection, The Hawk in the Rain, in 1957. Although it isn't made explicit to which war the poem refers, it is one of a number in this collection which explore the First World War. Ted Hughes was obsessed by this conflict. His father, William Hughes, was a survivor of the Gallipoli campaign which took place in Turkey from the 25th of April 1915 to the 9th of January 1916. The men fought in scorching temperatures during the summer months and freezing blizzards during the winter months. William Hughes later went on to fight in France, receiving the Distinguished Conduct Medal in September 1918, after the Battle of Ypres. The poem, which takes place in the heat of battle as an unnamed soldier appears to go over the top, explores the contrast between the idealistic patriotism which had young men enlisting in droves at the beginning of the conflict and the brutal reality of battle where the men on the ground were treated as expendable pawns. The action covered by the poem probably only takes a couple of minutes in real time. Hughes wrote about the impact this war had on his childhood, even though he was born some twelve years after it ended. The big, ever-present, overshadowing thing was the First World War, in which my father and my uncles fought, and which seemed to have killed every other young man my relatives had known. Professor Dennis Walder has written of Hughes that he was a war poet at one remove, writing out of the impact of memory, the individual memory of his father, and the collective memory of English culture. The poem comprises three stanzas of eight, seven and eight lines respectively of between eight and thirteen syllables. It is written in free verse. There is no rhyme scheme and no fixed rhythmic structure. It is written in the past tense and in the third person, but although the reader is an onlooker, it is exclusively from the perspective of one person, i.e. the unnamed soldier. There's no sense of the presence of his fellow soldiers which makes the poem seem more intense. He may be part of a regiment, but he is effectively alone. There's a significant amount of enjambment and caesura, which as well as creating pace, also create an irregular rhythm, perhaps evoking the soldier's sense of panic as he runs headlong towards almost certain death. Hughes makes use of long sentences, frequently employing commas and semicolons, as well as, in the first two stanzas, polyptyton, which is the repetition of words that, although grammatically different, come from the same root, such as running and runs, which all help add to the relentless pace of the poem. The title is a simple one. A bayonet is a knife, sword or spike-shaped weapon that is fitted to the end of the muzzle of a rifle and is meant for hand-to-hand -hand combat. A charge is an offensive manoeuvre in battle where soldiers move as fast as they can in a shock attack towards another group or a fortified line. Bayonets were mostly used in charging situations and these were frequent during the First World War. Many soldiers were, naturally, reluctant to use a weapon such as this, and, as a result, were given pep talks by people such as Lieutenant Colonel R. B. Campbell, who was in charge of the British Expeditionary Forces School of Physical and Bayonet Training. An Army official correspondent recalled, Colonel Ronald Campbell was a great lecturer on bayonet exercise. He curdled the blood of boys with his eloquence on the method of attack to pierce liver and lights and kidneys out of the enemy. He made their eyes bulge out of their heads, fired them with bloodlust, stoked up hatred of Germans, all in a quiet, earnest and persuasive voice and a sense of latent power and passion in him. 
The poem begins in medias res, or in the middle of the action. Suddenly he awoke and was running. This makes it more dramatic, as the reader is momentarily confused. Is he waking from actual sleep? Is it a flashback caused by shell shock? Has he suddenly come to life from a state of torpor? Don't forget that a lot of the war for the men was spent endlessly waiting for something to happen. And then, when orders were given, a reflex action kicked in, causing them to act instinctively. Or is this an indication of the metaphorical awakening from his illusions that he experiences later on in the poem? The line continues to describe how he is raw in raw seamed hot khaki, his sweat heavy. Caesura near the end of this first line makes the word raw stand out. In what sense does Hughes mean that he was raw? Is he raw as in a new recruit and therefore inexperienced? Does raw mean sore and painful? Or are his emotions raw, i.e. is he vulnerable and fearful? The use of raw and then raw seamed is a form of repetition called antanaclysis, which is where the repeated words have different meanings. British soldiers went to war in 1914 wearing the 1902 pattern service dress tunic and trousers, which were made of a thick woollen material dyed khaki for camouflage. The adjective raw seamed alludes to the way in which the cut edges of the fabric have not been sewn over. They are rough and frayed and are probably rubbing on his skin. Uniforms were cheaply made and uncomfortable to wear. His sense of physical discomfort is enhanced by Hugh's use of sound patterning and stress in these lines. The presence of sibilance, alliteration and the assonance of the short e eh vowel sound in sweat heavy enhance the sense of being weighed down. Note that of the ten syllables in this line, six of them are stressed, adding to the sense of heaviness. As he runs, he is stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire. The verb stumbling suggests clumsiness and being hampered by something. He is at a disadvantage as he is charging with his bayonet across a rough field littered with clods or lumps of earth, whilst being fired upon from a distance by soldiers who are protected by some kind of green hedge. He also must be suffering from impaired vision and disorientation due to the dazzle of the rifle fire. He can hear rather than see the bullets smashing the belly out of the air. By effectively solidifying the air and giving it substance, and a human one at that, this anthropomorphism reminds us of what the bullets are designed to do, cause vicious and fatal injuries. The plosive alliteration of the b consonant sounds and the consonants of l sounds along with the harsh onomatopoeia of the word smacking evokes the harshness and force of the gunfire. The poet's diction conveys the way in which the soldier is hampered by his equipment. He lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm. The verb lugged communicates the heaviness of the rifle and the difficulty with which he carries it. The simile, numb as a smashed arm, suggests that, rather than making him more powerful, the weapon seems to be a third, useless upper limb which slows him down and disables him. The first stanza ends with the image of the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eyes, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. The use of the pluperfect tense had brimmed suggests an action in the past which is no longer applicable. He had been carried away by his patriotism, but he no longer feels this way. 
The juxtaposition of the rather lofty image in the first of these lines with the quite delicate brimmed in his eyes, with the harsh, almost animal image in the second of the two lines, where the tears are now sweating like molten iron, demonstrates how starkly his feelings have changed. The adjective molten suggests their extreme heat and scalding nature. At the beginning of the second stanza, he experiences a feeling of bewilderment which almost makes him stop. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? The rhetorical question reveals a moment of sudden self-doubt. He is having an existential crisis as he wonders, in bewilderment, about his place in space and time. The metaphor, cold clockwork of the stars and the nations, suggests inevitable forward motion and intimates that he has realised he is just one small component, i.e. a hand on a clock face, in a much larger machine. The fact that the clockwork is cold suggests a lack of emotion. In much the same way as time marches inexorably and mercilessly forward, so do the machinations of the men representing the nations who are at war with one another. The alliteration and guttural consonants of the k sounds and the dissonance these create are harsh and unforgiving, reflecting his place in an unfeeling machine which does not care for him as an individual. The stanza continues. He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs, listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running, and his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. The simile likens him to a man who has jumped up in the literal dark of night, and can only use his sense of hearing as a means of ascertaining the rationale for his actions. In the dark may well refer to metaphorical darkness or ignorance, i.e. when you are kept in the dark about something. As the soldier is running towards his almost certain death, he is simultaneously seeking to rationalise his part in this war. Note the enjambment here, with a sentence that goes on relentlessly over five lines and conjures the way he continues to run. The inability of the reader to pause to take breath also helps to evoke the breathlessness of the soldier as he runs. The caesura in the middle of the final line of this stanza abruptly pulls the sentence up as he seems to freeze for a split second, listening between his footfalls for the reason, with one foot in the air, like statuary, or a statue, mid-stride. Enjambment carries the beginning of the next sentence from the end of the second stanza over into the beginning of the third. Then the shot-slashed furrows threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. This image is probably the most obscure in the whole poem. Is the yellow hare a literal animal which has been blasted or thrown up by the gunfire that has slashed the furrows? If so, this could be a reference to the way in which the war is destroying the beauty of the natural world, as presumably this charge and the ensuing battle are taking place in land that was once agricultural. The verb threw up communicates the way in which the force of the shots have propelled the creature from the ground. The simile rolled like a flame, as connotations of fire and, therefore, destruction. Hares are known for being fast, but this one's natural power has been snatched away as it crawled into a threshing circle. Threshing circles are found in Greece and Crete, and are demarcated by small standing stones. After the harvest, the ripe wheat or barley was spread on the floor, and then a wooden sled-shaped object with spikes was dragged over it, separating the grain from the stalks. 
The use of this image may again be to refer obliquely to the destruction of the land's agricultural heritage. Threshing is also another word for thrashing, or moving around violently, and in combination with the description of the hare with its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out, is a graphic image communicating unbearable pain. Animals often, however, have symbolic meanings in Hugh's poetry, so it is entirely possible that it is a metaphor for something else, perhaps within the soldier himself, such as his fear. The hare appears right at the moment that he pauses for a fraction of a second, consumed by hesitancy, and the adjective yellow does have connotations of cowardice. The flame might suggest that it has the power to consume and destroy him. Whatever the image means, the soldier leaves it behind as he plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. Despite his epiphany, he decides to fight. After all, it is kill or be killed. The verb plunged communicates his newfound resolution and the irrevocability of his actions. As he moves forward, it is clear that it is now all about his own survival, as king, honour, human dignity, etc., dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue, crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. His actions are not motivated by these patriotic ideals he can no longer afford. The use of the word etc., summarily dismisses the rest of them as they have become words which are empty of significance. The poem ends pretty much where it started, with the unnamed soldier still running towards the enemy lines. As he runs, he yells, desperate to get out of that blue crackling air, the onomatopoeia here once more evoking the sound of the rifle fire, which is what will cause his terror to ignite and explode like touchy dynamite. The adjective touchy means oversensitive or quick to anger, and the alliteration of the plosive t sounds enhance the idea of an explosion. The end of the poem is as raw as its beginning, with the soldier's ability to hold himself together in the face of terror on a knife edge. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.